Good evening, everyone. I would like to say uh, thank you, first of all, for the opportunity to be here on Capitol Hill to talk about this very important uh, circumstance, and that is the recognition and reparation for the Armenian genocide. Um, I want to first make some introductory comments before I go into my uh, conversation. I want to give a personal anecdote, but before I do that, I will uh, say my uh, thanks first to uh, several persons responsible for this organization of the event. Uh, for Aram Amparian, uh, Executive Director of the Washington DC uh, chapter of the uh, ANCA. Uh, for Teresa, um, my friend, uh, we first met uh, nine years ago in DC. And just to put some context, I've been presenting on the Armenian Genocide for the last 13 years now. And um, an old lady, when I went to Yerevan last uh, December, she said to me, all I need to add to my uh, last name is I-A-N to become an Armenian. So I'm now Mac Macalpinian. <laughs> I want to talk about uh, just the critical importance of congressional partnership and support. And without uh, that, we can't hope for legislative uh, victories for the recognition of the Armenian Genocide. And so in that regard, I want to uh, thank uh, Congressman Sherman, uh, original co-sponsor of HRES 296. I also want to thank um, Congressman Johnson uh, of the Congressional Black Caucus, a supporter of demining efforts in Artsakh, and all the other co-sponsors of HRES 296. It certainly is appreciated, and though I don't stand as a representative politically of Armenia, I stand as an advocate and a supporter uh, of rightful recognition of the Armenian Genocide. So I'll go back to the personal anecdote. I'm from Jamaica, and in 1986, my uh, sister, she's a history teacher, that was the first time I heard of the Armenian Genocide and Armenians. It was called A History of the People of the World. It was a history book. Can't tell you the name of the author now. But I read of Nagorno-Karabakh. I said, where, where can I find this place on the map? And I remember I, I, I searched and I saw Armenia as a part of USSR. The then maps uh, mapped it as USSR. Fast forward almost 17 years later, while I was doing my PhD at Brown University, I was asked to present on questions of genocide and reparations. And since then, Professor Henry Theriol and myself, we've been working on the Armenian Genocide. It took me full circle, but um, I've been a strident advocate for recognition for the Armenian Genocide, and I will continue to do so, because I believe in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so when we talk about recognition, part of what I want to do in today's conversation is to talk about the critical importance of recognition. Why it is important to recognize the Armenian Genocide. As you can see on the screen, that is how I intend to organize. Uh, conceptualize genocide. Um, not just to define it, but to conceptualize it. To talk about reparations and the importance of reparations. To talk about HRS 296, there's a type, typo there. Um, to talk about the goals of reparations, to talk about the lessons from the Holocaust and the transatlantic trading Africans and concluding remarks. When we talk about genocide, there are some descriptors that we have to be clear about, and that is the systematic and willful destruction. When we talk about genocides, they never are the fanciful characterization of a descent into um, spur of the moment. It is calculated, it is rational, and though we may not think of it as rational, it fulfills a rational end. And that is, I call genocides extreme nation building projects. Because what genocides do is that they create a notion of the nation state that says some people belong and others are to be excluded. It is planned and it is deliberate and the intent, the intent is to annihilate, to exterminate, to eliminate and to obliterate a clearly identified group. That obliteration is not only physical, 
it is psychological, it is cultural, it is religious. And so when we talk about genocide, I want us to understand uh, the uh, groundings of what we talk about. Uh, as, of, as we know, the lecture series is named after uh, eminent uh, Polish jurist, Jewish lawyer Raphael Lemkin, who coined the term. And I like his annexing of, for those who are linguists, Greek and Latin. So he combines genus, meaning race or people, and kede, or side, uh, in the English, the act of killing. Why do genocides happen? Every genocide that has ever occurred has been caused by a combination or all of the following factors. Hatred, intolerance, ignorance, and scapegoating. When you think of the relationship of xenophobia with genocide, you understand that the first thing starts with this idea of hating the other. You have to first create the other, and the Turks, the Ottoman uh, Empire, created Armenians as the other, and after that they began a uh, program of scapegoating and the facilitation or the expansion of ignorance. All genocides, I would argue, have four aspects. Uh, there is a plan, there are obviously participants, there are purges, and then there is a program of extinction. So when we talk about genocides, I want us to be clear that it, it involves strategy. It may be banal strategies, but it involves strategizing. When you think of the Rwandan genocide, uh, maybe in our 20th, late 20th century, the fastest committed genocide, uh, having seen one million people killed in 100 days, you realize that planning is involved in the uh, banality of this evil exercise of genocide. But I want us to expand this idea of reparations because I've heard many of the conversations um, in many groups and across society that takes reparations to be about cash disbursements. To be clear, within the context of Armenia, when we talk about reparations, or when I talk about reparations, I'm talking about the return of sequestrated and seized lands, uh, assets, properties, uh, churches, monasteries, and very basic but very critical familial heirlooms, including lots of uh, jewelry. When I went to Armenia two, um, sorry, a year ago, and we spoke about this question of return, we're not just talking now the repatriation of people and the resettlement of people, we're talking the return of heirlooms, of family items, of things that are still in the possession of others. So when we talk about genocide, it is any act or series of acts that aim to redress some wrong committed especially by a state against its citizens or those of another country. So I want us to think of reparations as more comprehensive than monetary compensation. Um, when we talk about reparations, we have to first talk about acknowledgement, recognition, which is why the title of my talk is about recognition, because before compensation occurs, recognition has to occur. But just quickly so we understand, these uh, slides jump to me. So just to understand uh, just the history of genocides in the last 400 years, I start with 1619, and this year we commemorate the 400th year of the arrival of the first Africans to Jamestown, though uh, historically, that is not the first time Africans would have been here in the U.S. They uh, began to arrive under the auspices of the, the Spanish and the Portuguese in Florida and in South Carolina, starting in 1526. So when we talk about genocides, we see uh, several of those committals across the centuries. Uh, the first 20th century genocide is that of the Herrera Namaqua, and that is where the Germans learn many of the methodology they eventually appropriate against the Jews in Nazi Germany. They practice those on the Herero Namakwa people in German uh, Southwest Africa. More contemporaneously, we see uh, these recent genocides. So I want to talk about the goals of reparations for the Armenian genocide. The first is to trample denial. The goal of reparations is to trample denial by mentoring 
historical rectification. The granting of reparations ensures that the cloak of denial is removed. Once reparations are granted, there is no hiding behind the invention of history and selective recall by the Turkish state. Reparations takes power away from perpetrators and deniers and gives this power to the victims, survivors, and descendants. So we have to trample denial. That is the cause celebrate for reparations for the Armenian genocide. It is to trample denial. The second goal of reparations is to remediate victim identity. The remediation of the Armenian identity is to effect what I would call the reclamation of personhood. Much of Armenian identity has been shaped by tragedy and its, its extended trauma. Reparations is not, it is not that 1.5 million faceless people died, it is that men, women, children were killed because they happened to belong to a minority that did not fit into the nation and state building project of Ottoman Turkey. And so the remediation of this victim identity is to ensure that the Armenian identity extends and expands beyond the trauma. The third goal is to establish compensation. The Armenian Genocide Reparations Study Group, of which I was one of the members, we had a comprehensive report on the Armenian Genocide and Reparations called Resolution with Justice. It talks about a comprehensive reparation package mm -hmm. of repair. This history honoring uh, mechanism is focused on the return of confiscated and sequestered property, land and possessions taken from the Armenians in the committal of genocide. The right of return is not just a matter of physical resettlement, it is also a repatriation of property and other assets forcibly taken as the Armenians are walked into genocide. Fourth, and very critically, because one of the consequences of genocide is the dehumanization of peoples. And I argue that reparations can rehumanize Armenians. The most potent weapon in the arsenal of genocide years is to forcibly remove the humanity and dignity of the genocided. Genocide represents a radical evil that is transformed into moral rightness because our country, our land, has been rid of these vermin. You begin to dehumanize people as a way of removing anyone feeling sorry for their demise. Genocides of necessity are tools of expunging the humanity of victims. And so reparations rehumanizes those who died and also those who live on. See, one of the important things about reparations is that it is retrospective. It not only rehumanizes, it remembers. And I make a distinction between remembering and remembering. Because to remember means to put back together things that have been disjointed or separated. Reparations provides the opportunity to honestly engage the past, making peace with the past because it serves as a mechanism of atonement for the sin of genocide. And so the process of remembering is to actually put back in a kind of psychological putting together of flesh the, the memory of Armenians, those that were lost, those who didn't have uh, names recorded, those who didn't have loved ones who uh, knew of their demise. All of those uh, people are remembered, not just remembered, but remembered. When we talk about reparations, I frame it in a larger question of transitional justice because Turkey wants to portend uh, its attempt at democratization, but I argue that there's absolutely no way we can talk about the question of democratic transition without reparations. Reparations, though necessary, is not a sufficient requirement of a democratic transition. Transitional justice is really seeking an answer to the question how do we deal with the past? Turkey has not asked or answered that question. How do we deal with the past? Instead, the past has been sanitized, and as Umit Ungor says, they have organized oblivion. They have taken Armenia out of history altogether. 
Turkey is therefore not ultimately a truly democratic society. One, because it does not reckon with its past, and two, it is a polity enamored by repression and intimidation. When we talk about uh, democratization, we can't expect to remove the blight of the Armenian genocide. There is absolutely no way to get to justice and to democratization without addressing this vexing historical problem. So Turkey cannot proclaim democracy while denying its historical obligation to provide reparations. So what is the importance of HR, uh, sorry, HRS 296? And I want to talk about that for a little so we can have some time for discussion. There are five important points concerning HRS 296. I think first it will send the message that the U.S. will honor its commitments to historical rectification because HRES is about doing something that was uh, done many years before uh, under Henry Morgenthau and his observations in Ottoman Turkey. So it's not reinventing the wheel, but it is in the contemporary ensuring that this kind of recognition leads to decisive action. Second, it will remove the veil of diplomatic protection of denial by Turkey of the genocide. And the hatred is therefore very critically important in helping this fight and this cause of reparations for the Armenian genocide. There's absolutely no way that HRES would be passed and Turkey would still have that diplomatic protection of denial. And so it is critical that we gather up support for HRES 296 and other such efforts. Third, it provides global, it, 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 it indicates the U.S.'s uh, global leadership in human rights demands and that initiates strategic actions and legislations. That is also critically important because if the U.S. is going to lead, it must first uh, recognize some of these critically important historical details that will require support. So it's critically important that uh, the U.S. continues this effort at global human rights leadership by ensuring that it passes such legislations. I think effectively when we talk about injustice, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And so we have to localize this reality that historic injustice must never ever be dismissed because it doesn't fit neatly into our contemporary world. I've heard the same argument concerning reparations for slavery, that it was so long ago it doesn't fit the obligations of the contemporary. But competing contemporary obligations cannot nullify historical injustice. There's absolutely no way. And the same way I feel about reparations for slavery, in this point I feel about the Armenian genocide. There's absolutely no way the contemporary imperatives should override that we continue to have the continuation of the genocide. Because if it has not been resolved, then it has continued. So I speak about the continuation of the Armenian genocide, though 1923 is almost 100 years ago. History will judge us as having failed our antecedents by allowing them to be forgotten by virtue of not supporting genocide recognition and by extension reparations. The two go hand in hand. If you are going to talk about genocide recognition, the way you resolve effectively this idea of history is through reparations. So what can we learn? Because one of the, 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 the cases that I've been thinking about in preparation for this uh, lecture was the Holocaust. What are some of the lessons we can learn? The first is simply this, granting reparations for the genocidal killing of Jews means that while the tragedy still helps to shape Jewish identity, the remembrance focuses on the event rather than the injustice and ignominy of denial. I call the Armenian identity a traumatic identity because that is effectively what it is, because the entire uh, cultural identity is formed around the genocide. And we are not doing the uh, historic service of recognizing Armenia as having 5,000 years of pre-genocidal history. 
but in the contemporary we focus only on this kind of idea that they have been the victims, survivors, and descendants of genocide. And so I argue that <coughs> much that we can learn from the Jewish Holocaust and reparations is that the remembrance focuses on the event, but not on the ignominy and denial of suffering. The second, and very importantly, genocide cannot kill the memory or resilience of a motivated people. Wherever I go to talk about the Armenian Genocide and about reparations for slavery, I realize that it takes uh, a high level of motivation to, to be a champion and an advocate for justice. Not just in the uh, esoteric communities to which we belong, but cross-cultural, cross-racial, uh, cross-religious um, alliances and proclivities. So genocide has not and cannot kill the memory and resilience of people. We've learned this from the Holocaust. Third, history reminds us that injustice and genocide knows no color, religion, or economic status. And that is why we have to be motivated to help and to advocate for change and justice wherever we see injustice. Fourth, the granting of reparations for the Holocaust involved the US and allies initiating the Nuremberg trials. Reparations and recognition for the Armenian Genocide will require, as I said, cross-racial religious alliances. Systems of oppression are the enemies. I want us to be clear that we are fighting against systems of oppression. The Turkish people are not the enemy. The system of denial that entraps them is what we are seeking to topple. And I think that is critically important when we talk about advocating for recognition and reparations. <clears throat> recognition is not only for the happenings of 1915 to 1923, it is for 2019, where Armenians continue to be a people traumatized by genocide and its continuation. In the same way that the lack of reparation for slavery perpetuates slavery, the denial of the Armenian genocide and lack of reparation extends the genocide. The first phase of the genocide was the killing of bodies. The second phase is the continued victimization of a people. And that is the longest phase of genocide. When we don't repair, we continue the victimization of people. And so, the time to act is now. Today, is the time for reparations. We have to be clear and we have to be motivated in this resolve to ensure that we act today as advocates of justice because to recognize the Armenian genocide is to seek after reparations and to seek after reparations is ultimately to seek after justice. Thank you.